In this week's episode, Darren Lee meets up with the drivers from the DTM. Hey race fans, join me in Munich as I speak to some of the best drivers in Europe who race in the Deutsche Tourenwagen Masters or DTM who all race under the Mercedes banner. And I'll be meeting up with a Petronas talent development rider that's racing in the Petronas AAM Malaysian Cup Prix Championship and the Petronas Asia Road Racing Championship. Hey guys, stick around because I'll be having a little chat with Ramdan Rosli right here at Sepang International Circuit. Hi, my name is Ramdan Rosli. You are watching Motorsport at Petronas. And we are in Munich to speak to eight of our Mercedes DTM drivers. They will enlighten us on what it's like to be driving in the Deutsche Tourenwagen Masters and answer some pretty cool questions. This is the Olympia Stadion, built between 1968 and 1972. It is the heart of the Munich Olympic Park that was the main venue for the 1972 Summer Olympics. Designed by German architect Gunther Benisch. The site was actually a pit made by the bombings during World War II. It was designed to imitate the Alps. The sweeping and transparent canopy was to symbolize a new, democratic and optimistic Germany. The Deutsche Tourenwagen Masters is the most popular international touring car series. Basically, the drivers will cover a distance of 170 kilometers with two mandatory pit stops by which time, all tyres must be changed. Let's go talk to some of our drivers, shall we? I am here with Robert Wickens, folks. Thank you very much, Robert, for being with us. Okay, no could you tell us the difference between driving in a single-seated car and a touring car? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I think the DTM car isn't really... It, it's a touring car, but it's almost a sports car. Yeah. You know, it's, it's truly impressive. It's the first time I've ever driven anything with a roof over my head because I've been a single-seater my whole career. And, I didn't know what to expect the first time I drove the car. And, um, you know, I was awake at night before the first testing, like, oh, it's going to be so weird. I'm not in the middle of the car. I'm to a bit to the left, and, you know, there's a roof. I can't see my tires. But then it went out, and it's a proper racing car. So, really, it, the difference is it's a little bit heavier than a single seater. But apart from that, the braking's phenomenal. Everything's phenomenal. I mean, I mean yeah, I, I, w I was truly impressed. It was much better than I expected. Okay, cool. So you're one of the Mercedes-Benz DTM Junior Team drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, and Michael Schumacher is uh, a patron. How was that like to have him as your mentor? Um, you couldn't pick a better person, I think. You know, if you look through the, um, the record books, I mean, it's Michael Schumacher, Michael Schumacher, Michael Schumacher. So, I mean, he's the perfect mentor for, for the Mercedes-Benz Junior Team. And I think, uh, yeah, so far, I mean, he's a busy guy, but when you get a hold of him to actually get a few tips and stuff, it, it's all worthwhile. And, yeah, I mean, it's big help for sure. What is the racing style of DTM drivers? Uh, in DTM, I think it's much tough, much more than a single seater like uh, Formula 3 that I raced last year, because in Formula 3, maybe if you start first, it's quite easy to win because the guys that are behind you, they're struggling because they lose a lot of downforce and it's hard to follow one car, but in DTM, you have not that problem you have, but in less way that compared to a single seater, because the car is it's bigger and you don't have that much downforce as in Formula car. Then it's easier to overtake in DTM and it's also tough because you, the people can push you on the back and just push you out of the track. And, and it's quite hard, but it's quite funny at the same time because you can do the same as they can do with you. Then the first lap is always really funny on DTM because it's a lot of contact and you can make a lot of positions or you can lose a lot of them. Then it's quite funny always to race in DTM. Is there a strategy to you and your team 
in the DTM race or is it just every man for himself? Um, no, obviously every race is different because it depends where you start on the grid and how the conditions are, what kind of start it will be. Obviously the last race we did in Norris Ring was wet and um, we had two Mercedes cars on the front row so in that case you definitely don't want to give away anything to your competitors on the first lap so we're always trying to work together when you've got your teammates around you um, to try and get the best end result for, for Mercedes. So um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's uh, half and half, I would say. Our fan base in Asia is slowly growing, yep. right? What makes the DTM exciting to watch and it's challenging for you? Uh, I think the biggest challenge in DTM is that the racing is, is so close. The lap times are so close. The level of driver is, is incredibly high and um, you have to get you know, the most the maximum out of the car and the drivers to, to be winning. And that's what makes it so challenging for the drivers, really. I think for the fans, um, until you see a DTM car, you don't realize how, how impressive they are. You know, they're, it, it looks similar to a, a touring car, you know, but they're really the F1 car of, F1, uh, of, D, of touring cars, basically. You know, that, a full carbon fiber body, they make a lot of noise, they've got big engines and a lot of downforce and they're very quick. So I think the cars themselves are very impressive for, for the people watching and also for the drivers to drive and just the competition level, it makes it so, so tough really. You've driven and raced in a, super, a Japanese Super GT before. Mm. What are the similarities with that race and the DTM? Well, it's, a, it's a long time ago actually, it was 96 I think. Uh, well, I mean, you can't really compare those cars. I think at the time, there were you know, well-advanced race cars, but today, if you look at a DTM car, uh, power to weight ratio, uh, safety, you know, because of the monocoque, uh, the technology below the car, it's more like a, a, you know, a simple Formula One than a road car. I mean, it has not, the shape is like a road car, but it's a Formula One technology, more or less. Then how do you train back then and for now? Would it be the same or would it be different? No, the training almost keeps, uh, maintains the same, basically. I mean, the best training you can have is drive as much as possible and beside, obviously, the track, have a special training for strengthening the, the upper body because of the, you know, G-forces you have. You're going to hurt your back on the long term otherwise if you're not fit. And especially, I think the main challenge in a DTM or in a closed car is the temperature itself because sometimes you run more than 80 degrees in a cockpit. Obviously, you are a very strong driver and you can race amongst the best um, but what are the challenges you have faced as a female competitor? It's a question I'm asked very often because obviously racing is a very man's world. Um, it's a tough one for me to answer because I've been racing since I was only eight years old. So for me, I grew up in racing. It was my sport. But I think as a female, you have to have um, pretty hard, uh, thick skin. I'm driving a pink car in the DTM. So I get many comments. Can you reverse your car into the pit garage? Do you have a space for your lipstick? It's the same uh, jokes that come up and I think it's a stereotype, you know, a blonde girl in a pink car and there's many guys who don't think women can race successfully against men and um, yeah, I'm not out there to, to try and prove them wrong or to try and beat as many men as I can. I'm simply out there to race because I love racing and I want to do the best job I can do. So it's, it's a tough question to answer. Well, you've been named the FIA, one of the FIA's women in motorsports ambassadors and there's a growing fan base in Asia for women to be taking part in motorsports. What would be your advice to them? Well first of all that's great to hear that there's more women in Asia um, starting motorsport because that's really the aim of the Women in Motorsport Commission. We would like to get more women involved in, in motorsport not just on the racetrack but also off the racetrack on the engineering on the team side on the management side on the communications the marketing side so first of all that's very positive news to hear um, and that's our aim you know as an ambassador it's up to me to um, to set a good example on the racetrack to be successful on the racetrack and to show many women who are, who are watching or who are maybe interested in motorsport that it is possible to one, have a career in motorsport and two, also be successful. German technology has been on the forefront of all the races across the world, including DTM. And also, all the German drivers seem to be dominating. Why do you think this is it? Maybe because we are, we are like to, to work hard. Um, so I do as well, especially I try to prepare my, myself as good as possible for the weekends. Not, all, not only training, also in, in point of uh, knowing the technology which is in the car. Um, 
we just try to put everything together uh, for the race weekend. Um, I do off the track to prepare myself with training and, and learning all that stuff I need to. And the engineers and the mechanics try to do the best their job on the car. And then we finally put it together on the race weekends and so far it worked out very successful. Okay, okay. Do you think, in your opinion, that the other countries like Japan and, and other countries will be looking to get into DTM? Well, I hope so, uh, especially in Japan. They are quite famous touring cars as well and very nice looking cars as well. So I think there would be something for them to join uh, the DTM cars. But as well, the USA is maybe a market uh, which could be something for the future. Now, we all know that training for a DTM race or any race is very rigorous. Um, how has training affected you physically or even mentally? Well, it's fair to say that the races in DTM are much shorter than, than Formula One. You know, it's an hour of racing. Uh, the biggest challenge coming from other formulas to DTM is the heat because you have the, the engine sitting in front of the driver running at 100 degrees, all that heat radiates into the cockpit. You have the exhaust systems down either side of the car and the, the chassis is made of carbon fibre and of course carbon is a great you know, transmitter of heat. So the cockpit temperature is 50 something degrees which is quite uncomfortable frankly when you have a race suit and a crash helmet and what have you. Now before a race, does it affect you mentally at all? Well, that's why I'm still racing, is because I enjoy the mental aspect of uh, the adrenaline that's released into the body when you know you're about to go and race. Um, you know, the sensation of pushing yourself to the limit, those, those, you know, that all affects the brain rather than the body more than anything, and that's a nice challenge. Um, you know, I maintain that I always race for pleasure and I was paid to do all of the marketing things. And then again today, you know, I race in DTM not because I see it as the springboard to be a Formula One driver, I've done that, um, but because I enjoy racing. And it's the other bits of, of racing which I don't really enjoy so much at 41 years old, but uh, there's nothing like getting strapped in a race car and getting ready to go racing. Since DTM is relatively new in Asia, I was really stoked to have met up with the drivers who are racing under the Mercedes banner. They are some of the best drivers in the world today, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm very glad to have had the chance to talk to them. Hi, I'm Farid Hayuman from Petronas Sintiam team. This is the bar in the car, that's what we call road cage. The road cage is to strengthen the body of the, the car and also to minimize the body roll when the car taking the corners. Ramdan Rosli, a name that is not foreign to Malaysia's motorsport scene, has been making his mark in both the Petronas AAM Malaysian Cup 3 Championship and the Petronas Asia Road Racing Championship. weekend of the Petronas AAM Malaysian Cup Prix right here at the Sepang International Circuit where rest assured you see a massive turnout of Cup Prix fans right here at the South Circuit. You've got roaring engines, you've got Raiden tea merchandises, memorabilia for sale and food, glorious food. This is an amazing weekend for all the petrol heads out there. Sepang International Circuit was designed by one of the four circuit designers recognized by the FIA, German engineer and driver Hermann Tilk. Officially inaugurated in 1999, it is the only true racing circuit in the Petronas AAM Malaysia Cup Re Championship calendar. I'm pretty excited to spend my weekend watching all the action, but to tell you the truth, I'm more excited to meet Ramdan. I haven't seen him for ages and to have a chat with him right here on the track where I personally feel I get to see the real him, that's just priceless. Hi Ramdan, how are you right now? How are you feeling? Uh, sekarang memang <laughs> saya feeling bagus, okay? Tak ada apa-apa masalah. Okay, overall 2012, how has your 2012 campaign been? Uh, tahun 2012 ni uh, saya lebih banyak beri, uh, diberikan penedahan oleh tim saya di mana saya uh, didedahkan dalam perlumbaan ARC untuk uh, membawa jentera uh, C100 uh, to CC dan pada tahun ni saya memang saya banyak belajar 
untuk lebih tunggang cara yang baik dan dapatkan pengalaman untuk beraksi tahun depan dengan lebih baik. Alright, what made you want to be a professional rider? When was it that you first decided, hey, I want to be doing this forever? Uh, saya mula minat dalam uh, pengumuman ni sebab uh, mula-mula bapa saya dulu ada uh, bawa pergi uh, tengok perlumbaan kapri dan sebagainya. Memang uh, dari isi hati saya sendiri memang saya uh, rasa saya boleh jadi rider yang profesional lah untuk Malaysia dan saya harap. Satu hari nanti saya boleh jadi rider yang baik ya. Okay, I'm sure you can. You still hold the record as the youngest ever rider to win a CP130 category in the Capri at only 15 years of age. How did that feel like? Uh, pada tahun lepas memang saya uh, mencatat rekod uh, rider pertama atau muda yang menjuarai pusingan di Capri ya, di mana. Memang sukar untuk uh, dibuat oleh rider-rider, uh, tapi memang saya kalau ikut tahun lepas memang saya target untuk dapatkan gelaran juara. Tapi saya tidak bernasib baik kerana uh, mendapat kecederaan pada saya, uh, saya punya kaki. Dan uh, tahun ini pun saya masih mencuba, uh, tapi masih harapan uh, untuk baki dua pusingan memang agak sukar. You actually raced in the Indo Pre Series. So, what was the difference between racing with um, Malaysian riders and Indonesian riders? Uh, perbezaan lumba dengan uh, rider Indonesia memang agak berbeza banding lumba di Malaysia. Di mana uh, lumba di Indo Prix memang uh, dia punya segi uh, perlumbaan memang berbeza. Di mana uh, dari segi lap, uh, di mana uh, Malaysia hanya membuat uh, 15 pusingan untuk kategori perdana dan di Indonesia. Uh, saya telah race 30 pusingan lah untuk uh, race Anubun. Memang agak berbeza dan cara fighting pun memang berbeza. I see. And you basically ride an underborn in the Capri and a 600cc in the ARRC which requires different riding styles. Is it hard to adapt to both riding styles? Uh, memang satu perbezaan yang besar di mana uh, beralih daripada uh, motosikal underbone ke uh, C100 memang uh, dari segi saiz dan kelajuan pun memang berbeza dan memerlukan uh, stamina yang tinggi yang untuk kendalikan jentera yang lebih besar. Unfortunately, you have been sidelined with injuries but how's the recovery period like and how do you keep your fitness level up? Uh, buat masa ini memang saya lebih kepada stamina untuk basikal dan berbasikal di mana uh, mengikut uh, doktor punya report memang saya tidak boleh uh, terlampau berat uh, mengangkat uh, peralatan gym lah. dan uh, sewaktu sekarang ini memang saya banyak berehat lagi untuk tangan saya dan saya banyakkan uh, daripada segi berbasikal lah penuh uh, dalam hujung minggu So, who is your racing idol and why? Uh, saya punya racing idol ialah Jorge Lorenzo sebab uh, beliau memiliki uh, ciri tunggangan yang hebat lah untuk uh, dalam kategori MotoGP dan saya uh, betul-betul minat dengan cahaya tunggangan dia dan uh, beliau memiliki rekod yang terbaik dalam MotoGP. Yeah, and he just won the MotoGP Championship, yeah? Hmm, well done, good choice. Okay, what are your hopes and aspirations for the future? Uh, saya harap dengan uh, selepas saya diberi pendedahan dalam uh, banyak cara saya harap saya boleh suatu hari nanti saya boleh beraksi dalam uh, kejuaraan MotoGP uh, seperti mana yang di dasarnya kau oleh Api Syarin dan saya harap saya boleh uh, jadi macam beliau. Alright, let's say a six year old boy is watching the show and he wants to be a professional rider just like you. And I'm sure throughout your years of experience you've seen those that have it and those that don't. So, what do you think are the steps that he needs to take to get here? Pada saya untuk menjadi seorang rider profesional uh, pada usia muda untuk cukir bakat pertama dia mesti uh, bermula pada pocket bike di mana uh, pocket bike adalah satu kira cara untuk bawa uh, pemula untuk bawa motor yang lebih bagus dan daripada teknik tunggangan yang bagus dan uh, dalam masa yang sama juga memerlukan sokongan daripada keluarga uh, supaya dapat lebih majukan lagi uh, dalam bidang motor ini. Okay, you've heard it from Ramdan. Thank you so much. Good luck, yeah. Ramdan Rosli has had a great start to his career as a professional rider. Making his mark in the Malaysian riding scene at a tender age of 15, 
That's only one way this young man is heading. Keep watching this space because with the right training and guidance, rest assured we'll see his name in flashing lights. Thanks for joining me, Julie Woon, right here on Motorsports at Petronas. For a motorcyclist, uh, there should be two mirrors, one on the left and one on the right. Yeah? And uh, people should be well versed with the mirrors, especially when you try to change lanes, you, you want to overtake, you know, you have to use the rear view mirror. You must know where is your position and of course when you move, you exactly know where the traffic flow is coming from. It can be from front or rear, so I think um, rear view mirror is a very, very important gadget uh, to, be, to be riding on the safety zone. Yeah? Um, of course, we all know that uh, uh, the mirrors shouldn't be uh, too small or the mirror shouldn't be uh, uh, too much of a defect for the uh, angle of it. Uh, so I think uh, people should ride. Just like you drive a car, you use so much uh, depending on the mirror. And, and I believe motorcycle, you should be even more well worse using the side mirrors. It's very, very important. Don't forget to log on to www.petmoss.com.my to find out more about your favourite teams, riders and race results. Join us as we are in Europe. Yes, we are. In Europe, who race is... I cannot feel my hands. Who race under the Deutsche... Deutsche. Who race in the Deutsche Tour? <laughs> At a tender age of 15, well, there's only one way this young man is...